we're going to transition to our first panel of the day, understanding the problem. And I'm going to uh, call the panelists and my co-moderator, Quentin Smith, up to the stage. I'll uh, introduce, introduce them while they're coming up. I suppose I can introduce them in the order that they're coming up. <laughs> uh, Ian Haney Lopez is the John H. Bolt Professor of Law at the University of California, Berkeley, teaching in the areas of race and constitutional law. We have Wesley Lowry, a national reporter with the Washington Post, and uh, who has extensively covered the interactions between law enforcement officials and communities. We have Janetta Elsie, a St. Louis native, community activist, and organizer, who co-founded Campaign Zero and was profiled on Forbes' 30 under 30 list. We have Douglas Blackman, Pulitzer Prize winning author of Slavery by Another Name, The Re-Enslavement of Black Americans from the Civil War to World War II. And we have uh, Carol Anderson, a historian and the Charles Howard Candler Professor of African American Studies at Emory University. So uh, Quentin will kick us off. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody hear me okay? Awesome. So my name is Quentin Smith, or Q, as most folk call me. Uh, I'm the fellow for the Committee on Diversity and Inclusion over at Sanford, and I am delighted to join you in what I promise to be a truly momentous day. So Ajane and I are the moderators for this first session, and again, it is called Understanding the Problem. Uh, the forum today is ambitious and forward-thinking in its goals, bringing diverse individuals to explore the full scope of the relationship between law enforcement and communities of color, as well as communities of lower socioeconomic standing. This session will focus on identifying historical and current factors that contribute to ongoing strained police community relations. Our goal in this session is to help provide you all with a common baseline of knowledge about the problem and equip you for the difficult yet vital conversations that are yet to come throughout the day. This panel will last until about 10.30, followed by a short break. Uh, we've already had our brief introductions, so we're gonna go ahead and launch into our moderated discussion. And after our moderated discussion, we'll open up for about 20 minutes of Q&A from the audience. So, the first prompt is gonna go to the panel as a whole. You'll each have five to six minutes to respond. So our mission in this session is to understand where we are today. If we're honest, it's a complicated and often contentious relationship between law enforcement and many communities of color across the country. So drawing on your individual backgrounds and expertise, exactly what is the problem and how did we get here? Who'd like to kick us off? We'll actually start with Doug. Okay, thank all right. Uh, well, thank you uh, for organizing this uh, remarkable event. It's great to see you again, yes. particularly. Uh, and, uh, but thanks for having me. Uh, the historian's answer, I think, to, uh, or at least my historian's answer to how we got here is, is first and foremost a, a, a fairly broad and maybe obvious thing, but that is simply our national refusal, our society's refusal uh, to, to even faintly attempt to fulfill the 13th Amendment for 150 years. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line of how we got here. Uh, it was the, the failure to execute on the outcome of the Civil War, uh, and uh, as, as overbroad as, as that may sound. But, but it is something we should be very aware of and, and, and of the some of the details of that. There was no serious or sustained effort to extend full citizenship to the vast majority of African Americans until, or, or from the time from the 1870s to the 1960s, uh, the, that, that span of a century in which there, there, is, there is no claim that can be made that any meaningful effort was made to ensure the actual full citizenship of African Americans. Not a single president in that period of time advocated in any significant or meaningful way for the integration of African Americans into the civic and economic mainstream of American life. Most presidents and presidential candidates actively opposed that idea, whether they were Democrats or Republicans. Uh, president Taft, in his inaugural address in 1909, went out of his way to praise North Carolina and all the southern states for having forced all African Americans off the voting rolls in the, in the years immediately prior to his inauguration. Woodrow Wilson, 
uh, also with roots in this neck of the woods, uh, uh, dramatically expanded segregation while he was president, ended long traditions of hiring of African Americans in the federal government, publicly praised the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, he, um, uh, he, he, not only did he allow The Birth of a Nation, the original film, Birth of a Nation, to be the first film screened at the White House, uh, he, uh, the first moving picture ever to be shown at the White House, he's in the damn film, you know, he's in it. His words are in it, praising the Ku Klux Klan. Um, uh, the, even people like FDR, the folks we want to lionize, but FDR readily agreed to exclude most blacks from the benefits of the New Deal. He guaranteed Southern senators that the federal government would not allow efforts to end the Depression to also uh, begin to end segregation. Dwight Eisenhower was indifferent to voting discrimination. John F. Kennedy was opposed to the March on Washington in 1963. And before he became president, there's, there's pretty substantial reason to believe he had probably never meaningfully met a black person who wasn't either a waiter or a butler or a maid. He certainly, certainly when Bobby Kennedy went to see uh, James Baldwin in New York City uh, uh, on this expedition that the, that the president sent him on early in his presidency, uh, that clearly was the first encounter that any member of the Kennedy family had ever been in, in which they had a serious and sustained conversation with African Americans um, about the situation of black people in America in any serious or meaningful way. Um, uh, no American president had ever campaigned on the idea that schools should be desegregated or that voting rights should be fully enforced. Not a one from the end of the Civil War to the, uh, to the beginning of the 1960s. And so, and, and until the early 20th century, there were essentially, and, and some people don't uh, get uncomfortable when I say this, but I think it's a fact, um, there were essentially no white people in America, and I mean not one. You know, 1900, 1905, 1910, there was not a single white person in America who genuinely believed in the full intellectual and innate equality of black and white Americans. By the beginning of the 20th century, there were a lot of white people who thought that black people should not be so actively harmed and that black people who had great capacity uh, should be able to achieve things uh, in American life. But there were no white people in America at the beginning of the 20th century who believed that all black people are basically equal to all white people. Not a one, nobody. None of your parents or grandparents or great grandparents or anybody else, not one. I, I defy anyone to, to prove otherwise to me. And if they prove one, then I'll say, okay, prove one more. My point, will still, <laughs> my point is still made. Uh, so given all that, it's no surprise that as the United States modernized its criminal codes and systems of, of law enforcement, the courts and incarceration, that the modern system of justice that emerged in the middle of the 20th century was still profoundly shaped by these general assumptions about black people that were rooted in powerful white supremacist thinking. And it was a thinking that presumes black men to be more dangerous and inclined, inclined to violence than anyone else, that black women were more likely to lie and to commit immoral acts, and at its core still operated on the idea that the primary purpose of encounters between law enforcement and black Americans was not to protect and defend African Americans, but to protect white people from African Americans. That was the primary purpose of all encounters between the law and black people in America, uh, and to ensure obedience, but not obedience to the law, but obedience to white people and the expectations of white people. That role of forced obedience had been transferred to our system of law enforcement, and that was still actively the case up until very, very modern times. Uh, and, and all of it rooted in this basic idea that ultimately all Americans would be better off, generally, including black people, that was part of the logic, would be better off if black men were treated by the police with a presumption of guilt and no hesitation to use brutality. Finally, how we got here was that generally decent and progressive thinking Americans, like the people in the room today, were willing to accept uh, this idea, which if you think back on it, is fairly preposterous, but we were all willing to accept that a handful of Supreme Court decisions in the 1960s and 70s, making it clearly illegal to deny basic civil rights to African Americans, that somehow that was miraculously enough to heal a vast criminal justice system that had been consciously designed to fail African Americans. That's a key point. Our system of justice is one that was designed to bring justice to white people, but designed to bring injustice to black people. Uh, and, and this is in the, th this is a, a system that was built to ensure 
uh, not equal application of the law, to not demand reasonable doubt uh, when black people were on trial, to not require judgment by their peers, and all of the other most fundamental rights that people like me and my parents and grandparents could expect. We refused to accept that the police and courts became for African Americans this kind of a system of injustice designed to deny them rights and to injure them while advantaging whites. What I'm saying is that nice white people allowed themselves the delusion that a system rooted in white supremacy, a system with a kind of, of genetic code drawn from the end of the 19th century had somehow been cured. And even more blindly ridiculous in hindsight was this belief that our system was pure, not just that it was healed of these past things, but it had become somehow pure and the most effective system of justice in the world, that somehow the 12-man jury actually always got things right. You know, I, I really believed that. I mean, I think most of you in this room who are over the age of 40 can remember in childhood, certainly if you're white, uh, that everything told us that, that the 12-man jury always got it right. And in these incredibly unlikely circumstances of getting it wrong, that there, was, there were other mechanisms in the system that would always catch that. So the idea of an innocent person being executed seemed almost impossible in that time. But, so we came to believe all those things, <clears throat> despite the monumental evidence that the vestiges of our apartheid system of disparate treatment under the law were still in full force. And now we're in a period of shock and reckoning because of two things. DNA technology has proven to us irrefutably, and the math of this is impossible to, to deny. We now know that somewhere between 5 and 10 percent, it's less than 10 percent, but it is likely higher than 5 percent, of all death penalty convictions over the last 25 years have been wrong. You know, between 5 and 10% of the people sentenced to death in our country have not, were, in fact, innocent of the crime that they were convicted of. Now, we've righted a bunch of those, not nearly all of them yet. But what that suggests, because death penalty cases are the Cadillac of our criminal justice system. More resources are expended. Everybody actually does have a lawyer. You know, the, the money is spent. You know, local governments go, go broke, paying for the defense of people who are, who are up, uh, who are, who are facing a capital charge. Uh, so it's the Cadillac of our system. It ought to be when our system works at its very best at adjudication and determining innocence. And so, the, so what that, if, if we get it 5 to 10% of the time in those cases wrong, well, what does that mean for the hundreds of thousands of other people who went through the, the used car version of, our, of the justice system? <laughs> uh, uh, and so it, it tells us, uh, almost without doubt, that there are tens of thousands of people imprisoned today who are innocent of the, of the crimes they were convicted of. That's just a fact. And there is almost no possibility that any more than a negligible number of those individuals, because of the way our system works, will ever find justice. They will serve out the entirety of their terms. The only possibility of, of change from that were, was what was happening late in the Obama administration, where there were these, uh, the, the largest number of commutations uh, by a president in history, but also a, a tiny drop in the bucket. Uh, compared to the enormity of the problems. And, so, and the second thing that is causing all of our shock right now and this reckoning with a reality that was plainly in front of us for generations is the cell phone camera. Uh, and so for the first time, thousands and thousands of millions of little cameras have stripped away the veneer and obfuscation that allowed us to still believe that, that every time there was a violent encounter between police and citizens, particularly African-American citizens, uh, that somehow the likelihood was this was a legitimate shooting or a legitimate uh, defensible act of brutality, and somehow it was always the fault of the citizen. And so these two things, DNA and a million little cameras, have finally forced us to confront this 150 years of staggering failure to fulfill our most fundamental notions of equality and justice. That's how we got here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Doug. You. We're going to have Carol go next. Thank you. And as a historian, what I'm going to focus on are the power of narratives. Those narratives that are sometimes are vague, sometimes unspoken, sometimes they're just these memories. Sometimes it's just the memories that lead a, a parent to put a hand on a child when the police are going by. Because what these narratives speak to 
are the violence that happens under the color of law. They speak to democratic institutions such as the court and the electorate that make a conscious decision to protect, sometimes to reward, police who abuse their authority, police who kill. I'm going to focus in on the period between 1945 and 1965 because that is another moment where we've got this legacy that is, is still in living memory. For example, in 1945, the U.S. Supreme Court heard the case of Claude Screws. He was a sheriff in Baker County, Georgia, and he and his deputies in the dead of night had arrested a black man, Robert Hall, for stealing a tire. Now, when they handcuffed him, they put him in the back of the car, they drove him to the, the jail, and then they said he tried to take their guns while handcuffed. So they had to beat him. They beat him for 30 minutes with a blackjack and with their fist until Robert Hall was dead. The U.S. attorney arrested Sheriff Screws and charged him with violating Bobby Hall's civil rights. He was found guilty. Screws took the case all the way up to the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, while this case is going up to the Supreme Court and he's got a guilty tag hanging on him, he wins re-election in Baker County. The Supreme Court said that Yes, Screws was acting under the color of law because he arrested Bobby Hall, but he did not violate Bobby Hall's civil rights. And that guilty verdict was overturned. In 1951, Florida Sheriff, Florida Sheriff Willis McCall, angry, angry that the US Supreme Court had basically vacated the sentence of two black men who were found guilty for a rape that never happened and said that they had to get a, new, a change of venue. And so as he's transporting uh, these two men, Sam Shepard and Walter Irvin, to the new venue, he takes the back roads, the off routes. He stops the car basically in the middle of the woods, opens up the door, tells them to get out. They're handcuffed. He drags them out of the car and starts loading bullets into them. The story that he tells is that they tried to overpower him with their hands cuffed behind their backs and that he was merely defending himself. But Walter Irvin lived. And Walter Irvin told the tale of what really happened in the woods that night in Florida. Willis McCall kept his job. He kept his job for another 20 plus years. The only way that man lost his job was that he was on trial in 1971 for beating another black man to death for which he was found not guilty but that they decided the good folks in his, his county in Florida decided to vote him out of office because maybe it was about time, and this is 1971. Then we have, because I, it's really clear that we understand this is not a Southern thing. This is an American thing. In Los Angeles, this is what's gonna take us to Watts. In Los Angeles, the police chief, William Parker, believed that African Americans were genetically criminal. And he began to amass a whole array of data to prove that criminality, therefore to justify the kind of hyper-policing that his force was doing in Watts, in the black neighborhood. You had officers on the force who called their nightsticks nigger knockers. You had residents of one of the most highly patrolled areas. The police called the residents in those areas, you know, we're patrolling Little Mississippi. And to understand what that means in the 1960s is to understand that at that moment, they are dragging the rivers in Mississippi 
because they're looking for the bodies of Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman, civil rights workers that Sheriff Cecil Price and his Klansmen have killed. And they're pulling bodies out of the river. And so when you have the LAPD calling this neighborhood of black people, Little Mississippi, you get a sense of what that frame of reference is. Between January 1962 and July 1965, Los Angeles law enforcement, mostly police, but also sheriff's deputies and highway patrol personnel, killed at least 65 people. Of the 65 homicides, the LA coroner's office investigated 64 were ruled justifiable homicide. These include 27 cases in which the victims were shot in the back, 25 in which the victim was unarmed, 23 in which the victim was suspected of a nonviolent crime, and four in which the victim was not suspected of any crime at all. The only case that the coroner's inquest ruled to be unjustified homicide was one in which two officers were, were playing cops and robbers in the Long Beach police station, shot a newspaper man. These are the stories like ghosts in the house of democracy that haunt and terrorize. That's how we got here. Thank you so much, Carol. We'll have Ian go next. I agree with so much of what's been said, but I want to push a little further as we think about racism. I want us to think about racism as doing work in society, as not simply an expression of hatred. We get into a pattern where we talk about racism as if racism is its own thing and its own engine and it has its own life and it has its own logic. And, um, and so we can talk about white supremacy in its aggressive form, white supremacy in its delusional form, white supremacy in its narrative form. And yet I want us to step outside and understand the work that white supremacy is doing in our society. And so I think in the context of mass incarceration, or actually, in this, and this is really drawing on a lot, a lot of, of, of uh, uh, Doug Blackman's excellent work. This is really a phenomenal book uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that Blackman wrote. Mm -hmm. The 13th Amendment failed not, I think, because of an excess of white supremacy, but because the South was committed to re-enslaving uh, the black population because its economy depended on it. And the 13th Amendment was structured in a way that it created a loophole where people could be reduced to slavery if they were convicted of a crime. And that meant that the criminal justice system was harnessed to the reproduction, the, the reestablishment of slavery, slavery by another name. Right? This is, uh, 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 again. Um, at the same time, not only is the legal system, the criminal justice system, engaged in directly reconstituting slavery, it's engaged in, in uh, um, policing the ability of African Americans to escape labor exploitation by criminalizing everything from gambling to performing music to being um, uh, 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 um, to, to existing without a labor contract. The criminal, the criminal system is designed in the South to force blacks back into labor relations of dire exploitation, right? So there's, a, there's this dramatic material aim. Um, Doug Massey has written a, a, a really good book about racial stratification in which he says racial stratification is tied initially in the United States to exploitation, to the creation of an ideology of race designed to justify exploitation rooted in barbaric violence. And you can think of that as slavery, you can think of that as convict leasing, you can think of that even in terms of genocide against Native Americans. I think it also applies in terms of manifest destiny and the U.S. conquest in the northern half of Mexico and then expansion into the Pacific as well as into the Caribbean. It is all tied to a racial ideology that is fundamentally rooted in an exploitative dynamic. 
How do we take from these people their land, their resources, their labor, their lives, and yet call ourselves human? That's racism. Right? But I don't think racism has remained exploitative. Right? It also, and this is Massey's point, it also takes the function of justifying hoarding of resources. Whites have taken so much from so many exploited people of color. I should say it slightly differently. Whites have taken so much from so many people and in the process have constructed the idea of their being white and of the people who are exploited being people of color. Because these are the social productions that are constituted by exploitative relations. They don't pre-exist the exploitative relations. They're the necessary ideological product to justify those relations. But having taken so much and having come to understand themselves as whites, whites then engage in a second aspect of racial stratification, the hoarding of what they've gained and what they've taken, the protecting of their ill-gotten resources through a narrative that tells themselves that they as white are the legitimate heirs to all that's good and wealthy um, and decent in America, neighborhoods, schools, corporations, government, and that these people of color who have been so badly exploited and reduced through that exploitation and that continued violence deserve nothing. And indeed, not only are undeserving, but have a larcenous approach, want to steal from the hardworking, decent, and innocent whites. Okay, and so I think it's, so I wanna, I wanna put on the table this materialist understanding of racism, that racism is doing work, that racism is constantly reinvented because what it's doing is it's allowing exploitation, it's allowing hoarding, and it's affording people an ideological justification to explain to themselves why they can engage in barbaric levels of violence and yet feel good about themselves and despise the people that they have dehumanized. That's a way of understanding racism that looks at the relationship between whites and non-whites. Mm -hmm. I think in addition, we need an account of the work that racism is doing among whites, because we see another phenomena as well, particularly pronounced in the last 50 years, but really part of the larger history of the United States. The United States has operated as, this is a South African term, a Herrenvolk democracy. Mm -hmm. That is a democracy, but not of everybody, a democracy that is limited by race. It's a democracy among whites, rather than a democracy that extends to all peoples. Within this Heron Volk democracy, whites compete with each other for the allegiance of other whites and in the process create an ethno-racial nationalism, right? You have political leaders, I should say this, you have people competing for power in a democracy that says power will be allocated by votes by going to the voters and telling the voters you exist as white people, and I am best prepared to protect you in your whiteness. That is, the rise of race becomes a way in which political leaders compete with each other for power among this white group, and in the process, further empower the notion of whiteness, further convince people that they're being white is something real and true and valuable about them. All pretty abstract. Let me bring it to mass incarceration. In the 1970s, we had about 200,000 people in prison and jail. Now it's over 2 million. Why the shift? Because in the 1970s, political leaders began to look for a way to express to whites that they understood the rising anxiety generated by the civil rights movement mm -hmm. and that they would protect whites from the encroaching demands of racial equality. But precisely because of the civil rights movement, they could not express that directly in a language of open white solidarity. Instead, they looked for proxy language. 
and one of the most potent proxy languages available <coughs> was the language of crime, mm -hmm. of law mm -hmm. and order, mm -hmm. of an innocent, silent majority beset by a crying wave from thugs from the inner city. Notice the racial imagery, the racial story is powerful. And yet it can also be denied that it's racial at all because the language of crime does not expressly use the language of race. And what you have is a move by Richard Nixon and then by Ronald Reagan to talk about a new war on drugs, a war on crime. What you have, in fact, is a remarkable substitution, even in Congress, of civil rights legislation for legislation that cracks down on crime. This is the response to black demands for equality. And the Democrats, for their part, do not stay silent for long when they realize how effective this strategy is. They pick it up themselves. Mm -hmm. And what you quickly have is an upward bidding war between Democrats and Republicans, and I have in mind Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton in, his, in her remarks about super predators, an upward bidding competition between both parties to show who's tougher on crime, by which they mean who's more willing to incarcerate African Americans. And to build a carceral, carceral system, we should be clear that also dramatically increases the, the incarceration rate of whites. Whites aren't spared this entirely. But the driving impetus for this is to show an anxious white electorate that their political leaders understand their anxiety, that their political leaders stress the importance, the goodness, the vulnerability, the innocence associated with being white, and that their political leaders are willing to impose whatever sort of punishment and dehumanization is necessary on the black community to prove to white people that their political leaders care for them and love them and deserve their vote. That's the story of mass incarceration. And now I want to, I'm going to conclude by actually, by turning this to police community relations. When we think about police killings of young black men, we often have a conversation that goes to the bigotry of individual officers, or maybe a conversation that goes to a culture of bigotry within police forces. I think both of those are important and right. But what we haven't had is a conversation about the way in which our political leaders have purposefully constructed the police as the defenders of white innocence and as the forward force in a war on encroaching black and brown criminality. That is, our police exist within a political culture that we have endured for 50 years, which has told the police, your job is to be the thin blue line between civilization and savagery. And, and, and that phrase, the thin blue line between civilization and savagery, uh, Professor Anderson mentioned uh, the LAPD. That comes straight out of the LAPD. It's one of the ways uh, that, that Chief Darrell Gates used to talk about the LAPD, mm -hmm. a thin blue line between civilization and savagery. If that's who you think you are, mm -hmm. if further you have been charged with waging a war on drugs that metamorphoses into a war on crime, you will conduct a war. And when it's a war, your job is to kill the enemy. And it, and, and, it is, and, it, and it is important that in a war that you not see your enemy as a human, for how else are you going to kill them? You must dehumanize them. You must fear them. You must feel like any sort of resistance to you is illegitimate, dangerous, a threat. And you must respond in kind. So that when we understand mass incarceration, I think we need to go well beyond stories of white supremacy as its own internal dynamic. And we need to understand the work that race is doing, that it is always done in terms of exploitation, in terms of, of hoarding, and perhaps most importantly of all in our current situation, the work that race does as a basis for competition among politicians and corporations and the wealthy donor class as they seek power in a democracy, a Heron-Volk democracy that favors whites, because as they seek power, they do so by convincing whites that they exist as whites, mm 
that whiteness is their most important characteristic, mm -hmm. that it makes them mm -hmm. innocent, that it makes them vulnerable, and that on the flip side, that blackness and brownness is our most important characteristic, and that it makes us guilty before we've ever done anything, all of us illegal aliens, and that it makes us criminal, and that it makes us violent, and that the most important thing to do is to destroy us. And that's how we got to where we are. Thank you, Ian. Uh, we're gonna have Janetta and then Wesley go next, and then we'll have one uh, follow-up question before we turn it over to the audience. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I actually didn't have anything prepared, so I typed while they were talking. Um, and I also do not have an academic perspective, so if you're looking for that, I'm not that. <laughs> um, and I think the question, it's not possible for me to answer it um, other than to tell my lived experience. So um, growing up, I lived in St. Louis my whole life. I'm 27 now, um, and I was 25 when Ferguson happened. Um, just growing up in general, I was born with a single mother um, who was a business owner, and she worked really, really hard to send me to private school. Um, and I went to all white schools my entire life and was told at a very early age from my grandparents who were from the deep south that we work twice as hard to be half as good as white people. So I took that with me to school every day um, as a challenge, like I am better than these white kids. So I was always smarter and I was always faster until puberty hit. And then, <laughs> and then so my strength was literally just to be smarter. Um, Leaving school, even at a really early age, I would leave my all white school where everything was happy and go to my aunt's house who lived in the west side of St. Louis. Um, and right across the street from her house is a dope house. And I would see every day coming home from school where the police might come to school and be like, hey, we're your friendly police officers. And I'd be like, mm, okay. And um, I would see them jumping out and arresting young black dudes across the street. If they were selling drugs, not sure. But I would just always see them like kidnapping people. Um, mm -hmm. And when I would leave my aunt's house, I would go to my mom's beauty salon that we owned, where it was like a haven for black women. Mm -hmm. um, and what I now know is self-care. I had no clue that's what we were doing. Um, so getting your hair done, my grandma washes your hair. We like, it's a therapy session <laughs> slash beautification. Like all these things happen in the beauty shop. So I'm a proud shop kid. Um, and I would say I've lived a few lives all at once. Um, I knew racism was real growing up in St. Louis. I could feel it. And I knew it growing up when white kids would invite me places, but say, oh, your mom can't pick you up. And she couldn't pick, them up, pick me up because she was dark skinned and I was light skinned and their, their mothers thought that my mother was loose so she couldn't be around their husbands. And it's interesting that kids will say anything that they hear at home. And I would always tell it right to my mom. So we would always have a problem. <laughs> based on things that my white classmates told me. Um, I would say I never knew exactly how evil policing was for black people until 2014. Um, my mother passed away January 31st, 2014. And two weeks later, the police in St. Louis City killed my best friend, Stefan Avery Hart. And I was so overwhelmed with my mom, like I really couldn't process that my friend Stefan was gone. Um, and I never really thought about it much, um, really wondered why they killed him, didn't get an answer, and just really focused on trying to come out of depression from my mom being gone. Um, 
And I never really thought more about Stefan until August 9th, 2014. And that was the day on Twitter, this lady that I follow named April, who lives in Mississippi, tweeted me and was like, Netta, people are talking about this boy getting killed. Here's a tweet, check it out. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no way. Not no way the police killed someone because they just killed my friends and I know what police in St. Louis do. They kill people, they kill black people, like all the time. Um, but it was no way that his body was still outside on that ground. And it was noon when I first saw it. And then it was like three o'clock when I finally kept getting more information and his body was still outside. And it's hot as hell in St. Louis in the mm -hmm. summertime, especially in August, it's super humid. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I know y'all still don't have this boy's body outside. Mm -hmm. Just laying like that. Um, so in my mind, I've officially went to, based on pictures I've seen, it's like a lynching. Like you're sending a sign to everybody that this could happen to you too. Protect, protecting the body with police officers and M16s, you're letting us know. If we even show like any type of emotion or remorse or sadness or anger that this too can happen to us. So that night I went to Ferguson with my best friend um, at around like nine o'clock at night. And that was the day that everything about my life changed really. I heard little black kids say, I saw Mike Mike get killed. And that really, it fucked with me um, because no black baby should know that. I've never known that. I didn't, I never saw someone get killed when I was little and they shouldn't have to see that. Um, or know that it's possible, or say the white man killed them. Like you, that's it's 2014. That stuff like that, that shouldn't still be happening. Um, so I just went and literally talked to a few people, and tweeted a few things. Didn't really know what to say or where to start. Um, and the next day was my first protest. Let me go back to my notes. Sorry. <laughs> um, Ooh. Okay. So since the day Mike was murdered, I have seen the worst of what this country is and can be. Um, I still haven't processed half of the things that I've seen or half the experiences that we've had. For example, watching police pull pregnant black women out of their cars and point M16s at them and tell them, fuck your baby. Like I've never gotten over that and I'll never forget it or having National Guardsmen chase us up a street called Lang in Ferguson um, and helicopters over above us, I'll never forget. Or the feeling of like laying low and flat and trying to be as quiet as I can be in some person's random backyard so they wouldn't find us because they had been told protect peace, whatever that means. So we know when we hear protect peace, that means you're gonna kill us. Um, I'll never forget being called an enemy combatant and I pay taxes there. And like the things that you're using to shoot and tear gas us with, I paid taxes for that too. And, whew, um, my goodness. I fought very hard with my family to even be at protests. They took my car. Uh, my grandmother and I had a really big fight because she did not want her baby going down there. And what her baby told her is, I'm exactly who you raised me to be. <laughs> and if something happens to me, then that means you come clown too. Um, so I never told her about being tear gassed ever, but I've been tear gassed 13 times. I've been shot with a rubber bullet once while standing with Wesley Lowry. <laughs> He's bad luck. <laughs> and being tear gassed 13 times and shot, I now have PTSD, the same symptoms as my grandpa, who is a Vietnam War veteran. So we share that pain and that trauma, and we should not have to. So that is just my summary of where I've, where I've been. Um, where I'm going is definitely different, and that's a blessing. Hmm. Um, and I try not to sit in my trauma. And I will say that being on panels and talking and reliving trauma all the time is really, really tiring. Hmm. 
And so even just sharing this part, I'm exhausted. But that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Tell the truth. <laughs> so it is true that Janetta got me tear gassed. <laughs> When I, when I first arrived in Ferguson, Missouri, I was a congressional reporter for the Washington Post. Um, I had just finished covering a Democratic primary race in some Senate race. I don't even remember who the candidates were. They lost. Um, and I had flown back to Washington the day after Michael Brown had been killed on August 10th. And as I got to the office the, that morning of the 11th on Monday, we realized um, that there had been an additional night of unrest and, and violence. The first night of violence being the night that Michael Brown was killed, the second night of violence being the night uh, when in these clashes uh, with the community, the Quick Trip gas station was burned down. It's, it's a bit of a commentary on the media and where we were then that a boy's body in the street for four hours did not prompt us to get on a plane to Ferguson, but a gas station being burned did. The, and as I arrived, um, I was getting on the plane, and I'm going to tease Nada as she teased me. Everyone was telling me, you got to find this woman, Janetta Elzey. Um, she seems to be everywhere. She'd, she'd left her home, her grandmother's house, and started tweeting, taking pictures. She seemed to know where all the protests were. She knew where all the, all the police were. And so everyone was like, you got to find her, interview her. What's, what's going on? And so Janetta began what has now been three years of us uh, teasing each other on panels by, I, I, direct, I, I direct messaged her on Twitter and said, look, you know, I'm a reporter from the Washington Post, I'm coming into town, I think it's important we tell this story the right way, um, can, can we meet up? And so Janetta's like, of course, here's my number, meet me here, and then she immediately begins live tweeting our DM conversation. <laughs> Y'all, can you believe it? A Washington Post reporter is coming to tell the story the right way. <laughs> I was like, I can see those tweets, Janetta, I follow you. <laughs> And so I, I land, and initially I go to the press conference, uh, the first press conference held by Michael Brown's family, um, which I, I'd, I'd covered officer-involved shootings in previous jobs at the Boston Globe and the Los Angeles Times. And so unfortunately, it felt familiar. I'd been in this room before. I'd seen the freshly minted t-shirts with the image of a slain son now um, emblazoned on them. I had known Benjamin Crump, the attorney who had arrived to work with the family. And after I left the press conference, I went to something that did not feel normal. I, I went to a, a meeting of the NAACP. They were hosting a, a forum, a community forum at a church in St. Louis. And as I got there, you know, I'd covered many community meetings in many different communities. As I arrived, I, I saw maybe 100, 200 people standing out in the parking lot. So I made the safe assumption that I had gotten the time wrong and the meeting must be over, um, that everyone must have been let out. Um, but as I walked to the front, what I realized was that this was not a group of people who had just been let out, nor were they waiting to get in, that the, the church was full to capacity. There were already several hundred people there, and that this hundred or two hundred people had decided they were going to stand out in the parking lot in August and wait until the meeting was over so that other people could come outside and tell them what had been said inside. As someone who had a relative sense of skepticism to what the staying power of the story was going to be, I'd gotten on the plane to Ferguson expecting to be there three days. I, it was a moment of, of shock as I had realized that this was a story that had staying power and that, and that there had been a line that had been crossed. You know, I went there thinking I was going to be there three days. I ended up spending about three months on the ground. Mm. Um, and now we're in, into year three of writing almost exclusively about issues of policing. Um, outside of, this is the last time on a teaser, but outside of this meeting, I finally meet up with Janetta Elsie, um, who's there with some friends of hers. And so she, she walks up and I told her, the part of the conversation she didn't immediately broadcast is I told her, I said, look, I'm going to be the light-skinned guy in the orange sweater. And so I walk up to her, and she looks at me, and she goes, you didn't tell me you were going to be this light-skinned. <laughs> I was like, I can't win with you, lady, can I? <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'm biracial. Blah, blah. She goes, okay, well, we've got a white friend named Wes already, so you can be 0.5 Wes. 
which she referred to me as for months. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> As <laughs> later that night, we got, we got tear gas. No, I got hit with a Weber bullet. Um, that was the first of many nights in many cities. Baltimore, uh, Charlotte, Milwaukee, Cleveland, New York, um, Charleston. The, but in those early days, it was unclear what was going to happen to this organic anger and pain being expressed in the streets each day. And, and there was a real, it now almost feels quaint ignorance from those of us in the media as to the depths of this story. I remember walking around those, those first days and doing interviews, talking to people in the streets, and, and I, I talked to them about what's the relationship between you know, you and the police here, what should we know? Do you have an anecdote? Do you have experiences? And I do all these interviews. And, you know, we use the term protester very often. I actually have grown to really dislike that term. I, I think that when a, someone has been killed in the street outside of your home and you step outside of your home and start asking questions of the person who's killed this person, you're not a protester, you're a resident. You, you're in your home, you, you live here, and you're asking questions of your government. The but as I'm having these conversations, what we're hearing is unarmed black men are being executed in the streets each day. They're killing us. And, and even when they're not killing us, they're harassing us, they're harming us, they're incarcerating us. And so being a good reporter, I'd write those things down and I'd take them back to the police who would say, whoa, 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 whoa. We never kill anybody. Most officers never draw their weapons throughout the course of their career. Almost no officers are involved in police shootings. And when we do, they are definitely not unarmed black people. And on the rare occasion when they are an unarmed black person, that person definitely deserved it anyway. And so I type all these quotes up. And it's fortunate, you know, one that, that didn't quite speak to my own lived experience, but I was fortunate to work at a place with smart editors and smart colleagues where as we had these conversations and we read over these stories, we came to the conclusion that both of those statements could not be true. <laughs> either the police are executing unarmed black people every day or police officers never pull their weapons and never kill anyone. And so we started making phone calls. We called Ferguson Police and St. Louis County Police who had no real records of how many people they had killed and if they did they weren't going to give them to us. So we called the Missouri Secretary of State. Surely at the state level they must know how many people are being killed by the police. Well they did not. So we us being the Washington Post, call Eric Holder. The DOJ's got to know. They got to keep these, this federal record. They have to have it. Well, they do not. Federal government, we called over to the Department of Justice, and they said, well, we have a number, but please don't use it. It's not accurate. I said, what are you talking about? And they go, well, we, we ask each year police departments to tell us about their fatal encounters, but it's a voluntary report. You know, there's a, just a few hundred departments tell us. There are 18,000 police departments in the United States of America. This was, at this point I knew we had a, a story, we had something we needed to look into, we needed to keep pursuing. Uh, some of my bosses could not believe this was true. I must have called the wrong person, uh, call someone else. Um, sure, you know, and, and I understand that. I, you know, I was of the impression as well that there should be a file cabinet somewhere with a manila envelope for each police shooting. I should be able to walk in with my FOIA request and look at all the envelopes. What we realized was that the best accounting of who is killed by the police under what circumstances were two crowdfunded efforts that consisted of people Googling killed by police every day and building themselves a spreadsheet. That there had been no modern anal analysis of who was being killed and under what circumstances. And so we were having a conversation about police shootings and about deaths at the hands of police officers in a void of evidence and facts. It existed solely in a world of anecdotes and emotion. And what we know about the world and the system in which we live is that some people's lived experiences in a world of anecdotes and emotions are valued and, and validated, and others are ignored. So we set out to attempt to answer these questions, beginning solely with how, how many people are being killed by the police, how often are they black, how often are they unarmed. 
and, and began to, to work towards how, how do we assemble this universe and understand it. So at the time, in that, that FBI, the FBI had said there had never been more than 463 people shot and killed by the police in any given year. Mm -hmm. um, the, and so just about a little more than one a day, one and a half a day. Now, as we started interrogating those numbers, we saw um, some real discrepancies. According to the FBI numbers, no police officer in the state of Florida has killed anyone in the last 10 years. According to the FBI numbers, Eric Gardner was never killed by the police, nor was Tamir Rice. They are not reported in the official statistics of who's been killed by the police. And so we set out to essentially replicate the citizen journalism that had been done previously. We could not rely solely on public records because police departments don't necessarily have to tell you who they kill. Certainly not in real time, and certainly not responsive to any layer of question. They might tell you someone is dead. Uh, but the actual circumstances, they, they don't necessarily have to be forthcoming with. That in fact, the most reliable way to know if someone has been killed by a police officer is to turn on your local news. Because if there's a body, there is a reporter somewhere who has written something about it. And that begins a tip sheet where you can now go back and file a records request and ask questions and find attorneys for families and talk to the families themselves. And so we set out to do this, and by five months into our first year, we tracked 500 of these shootings in the first five months of 2015. By the end of 2015, we tracked 991. So we found more than double the number of fatal shootings um, that the police had said existed. Now, what, did, what do we know about who is being killed and under what circumstances? We now have, this is an ongoing project, because so we now have two, two years and two and a half months of data. But for these purposes, I'll refer specifically to 2015 data. Our numbers have stayed consistent to date. What we, what we know is that, that, as the police would say, the vast majority of people in raw numbers are armed when they are killed, and the, vast majority, and the majority of them are white. But, but the statistics can't really be wielded that way, right? When you, when you start looking and drilling in specifically at, at, at different demographics, what you see is that while black Americans make up 12% of the population, they represent close to a quarter of those who are being killed by the police, and 40% of those who are unarmed when they are killed by the police. What we found in f further research is that there is no, especially when you look at the unarmed population, but when you look at the entirety of black people who are killed by the police, there is no determining factor, whether it be crime committed, crime level in the neighborhood where the shooting happens, what the person is doing in the moment of the fatal encounter, attacking an officer or running away, there is no factor more determinant to whether or not it, an unarmed person is killed by the police than whether they are black. Um, that there's no other way to parse the number. What we also found was that somewhere between a quarter and a half of those killed by the police are in the midst of some type of mental health crisis. Um, and that the majority of our officers are, in, are not adequately trained to interact with people in the midst of mental health crises. If a quarter to a half of the people being killed by the police were diabetics, every police officer would travel with insulin. Um, and yet the majority of officers are not uh, going through crisis intervention training um, to specifically train them to have these interactions. At the time, these numbers were very surprising to a lot of people. One, the sheer number, three people a day being shot and killed by the police. But also the reality that yes, all of the demonstrators in a Ferguson or Baltimore had not made it up. Apparently, the old Chappelle sketch, you know, apparently the police are beating up black people like hotcakes. I read it in Newsweek, it's in, the, it's in the June edition, right? And so one of the first reactions to this for many departments was the proliferation of body cameras. This idea that if one, it was twofold. It was to suggest a new transparency and the belief that if officers knew they were being watched, that, that it would lead to fewer fatal encounters. And second, speaking to this idea of white innocence that if only we could see more police interactions, all of you people would see that in reality, most of these people have it coming and deserve it. We saw hundreds of departments 
putting body cameras on their officers following 2014. In 2016, the second year of our study, we saw a significant increase in the number of fatal shootings captured on tape. Not just because of body cameras, but also because now anytime anyone saw a police officer, their cell phone camera came out. Um, also, you had a media that now thought to ask for videos for every <laughs> encounter with a police officer, when in fact, we did not always have that knowledge or that vigilance. In 2015, there were 142 of 990 police shootings captured on tape. 2016, there were 231 of 960, um, a d almost a doubling of the number of police shootings we could now watch with our own eyes. And what those videos showed us, first of all, was that the, that the preponderance of cameras did not actually, or the spread of cameras did not actually lead to any significant increase in the number of shootings. That after two years of a constant conversation and panel discussions like this and police vowing reforms, that the police killed almost exactly the same number of people in 2016 as they did in 2015 and 2014. But beyond that, what the body camera videos and the uh, bystander videos did was they did not, in fact, exonerate officers in more cases. They raised additional questions about cases that we previously wouldn't have asked questions about. Philando Castile, without a video camera, is an armed black man who pulled a gun on a cop, as is Alton Sterling, as is Keith Lamont Scott in Charlotte, that we've seen in case after case after case, beginning with Walter Scott in 2015, but carrying us to present day, that what video has done is that it is it has allowed the dead in these interactions to tell us in images what, what has happened. What we've, it's hard to remember now, but the Walter Scott shooting was not a shooting in, in Charleston, the North Charleston, South Carolina, it was not a shooting that immediately gained any headlines. It was not a shooting that anyone paid attention to. It was a shooting where an officer reported back to his superiors that a man had stolen his taser, was standing on top of him, about to tase him, and so he had to pull his gun in desperation to shoot and kill this man, menacing over him. The officer's attorney was quoted in the Post and Courier the next day saying that Michael Slager is the type of officer we hope all of our officers will be, that this was an example of his bravery and should be commended. That lie led Fenenden Santana, the bystander who had taken the video, to send that video to the family of Walter Scott. He said that he wanted to see what the police would say about what happened. He wanted to believe them, even though he himself had, had experiences of feeling racially profiled, of, of seeing disparate force. He, he himself had felt upset watching the images from Baltimore and Ferguson and elsewhere. He, he wanted to wait and see what happened. He wanted to see if the police, without any external pressure, would take accountability for this man who'd been shot in the back. When they did not, he released the video that we've now all seen thousands of times. Walter Scott running away, Michael Slager unholstering his gun and putting several bullets in, Michael Scott, or in Walter Scott's back. Uh, Wesley, I'm going to ask you to just stick a pin in that right there. Let's thank right. him. <laughs> what, what we'd like to do, just to make sure that we have some time uh, reserved for uh, uh, questions from the audience is I'm going to ask each uh, panelist to just say what they will about recommendations that they have for this police community relationship or what we want to see in democratic policing. Um, and certainly if you have any examples of, uh, of policing that you have witnessed to uh, or, or you know researched, heard about, read about, uh, to offer those up as well. But we'd like to just take a couple of minutes uh, for each panelist to uh, contribute what they will in, in, in terms of recommendations. And uh, you can go in whatever order you'd like. Consider this the lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'll go really quick. Um, I'm also a part of the Campaign Zero planning team, which is a 10-point policy plan on ending police violence in America. It's crafted by myself, Sam Sinyangwe, who is somewhere in this room. Um, oh, there's Sam. Hi, Sam. <laughs> um, DeRay McKesson and Brittany Packnett. Um, so that's my one suggestion. It's 10 suggestions. Uh, I, I would say very quickly, um, um, we need to go beyond demilitarizing the police and we need to disarm the police. 
that th this this metaphor of a war on crime has been translated into uh, attire and armaments and equipment, and we know from from social psychology that if you dress somebody up as a warrior and you give them the weapons of a warrior, they will behave as a warrior. And I think we need to take that insight and go a little bit further and say not only are we going to stop dressing our police as warriors, not only should we stop heavily recruiting from people who've been trained as warriors, right? We recruit so many of our police officers from the military, but in fact, we need to disarm the police because to the, to the extent that individuals enter into relationships with others in which they have a gun, they come into the relationship with the power to take life and they understand the relationship as fundamentally a conflict over power and whose life will be taken. And I think that, that in Ireland, in, in New Zealand, in England, we've seen that in fact, if you disarm the police, they come to understand themselves not as agents of violence, but as people serving other people. And, and that's the difference between a police force, which should be police, people serving other people, government serving the citizenry versus a military in which the aim is to kill and control the enemy. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, the, the one, I mean, there's so many things one could say, but the, the one thing I might say most uh, on a sort of what can a citizen do front is that the person in your world, wherever your world is, the person who uh, is responsible for the most incarcerating of people, rightly or wrongly, is the county sheriff, almost everywhere. The county sheriff is the person who puts the most people in jail. Uh, and that's almost certainly someone that you elect relatively frequently. Um, and there's a long history in, in America of, uh, of people who feel that law enforcement had gone awry, mostly this being poor white people uh, in the rural South and in other parts of the country in the late 19th and first half of the 20th century, but of people rising up against uh, what they consider to be abusive police practices. There's a long history of that, just it was only about abusive police practices of white people, uh, and but voting people out uh, who are engaged in those kinds of things. And, and uh, I think there is a little too much uh, uh, sitting around waiting uh, for campaign zero or somebody else to come along and you know sort these things out or waiting on President Obama to sort these things out or, or Attorney General Holder or now Jeff Sessions uh, to work these things out you know yeah. and Jeff Sessions is not coming and, <laughs> and Eric Holder is gone uh, and the but the uh, but the opportunity everybody has an opportunity in a very local sort of way uh, to act, and most of you probably haven't paid any attention even to who you voted for for sheriff in the past. Uh, but you do have, citizens do have a very direct voice uh, over, uh, and, and there is great discretion in the law. Uh, and there's great latitude about how, uh, how those things work. And I think we often ignore the most immediate thing that we could be a part of in terms of addressing some of these issues. And I think that one of the major issues is um, the way that blackness has been defined as criminal. Mm -hmm. um, and that the massive work that needs to be done both in the society and within police forces is to begin to redefine blackness. Because as long as we see blackness as criminal, then we will continue to have policing and we will continue to have a society that locks us up where blackness is our crime. Mm -hmm. um, and that requires undoing a lot of work. It requires, um, it requires in those, in the, it changing the culture within uh, police forces. It requires changing the way that we um, imagine. It requires changing the narratives about the stories that we tell. Um, that, it's, it's deep, hard work. It deals with implicit bias training and retraining. It deals with um, reward systems. It deals with, in fact, making the justice system much more accountable for when we see, there was no way that um, Walter Slager should have ever, ever been given a mistrial, given that, that the killing, the murder was so obvious. I mean, so it requires doing some heavy, heavy cultural lifting. That's what I think needs to be done. <laughs>
Thank you. And to briefly piggyback off of that, I think that the it's that the system as is works as it was constructed to work, which is to absolve police of acts of violence against people of color. Um, in the 10 years preceding Ferguson, they were on average, and remember we're talking about probably a thousand fatal encounters with police each year nationally. There were about five officers charged each year, um, less than one half of 1%. In the year after Ferguson, there were 18 of a thousand. Uh, the, the reality is our legal system as constructed is, is not structured to legally hold officers accountable, which raises an additional question of what is the role of the department themselves in holding their officers accountable. Um, that's difficult. Um, it's difficult to measure in part because these are not easy to come by records and pieces of information, what happens to an officer after, after they kill someone. Mm -hmm. um, but what we know in a survey sense is that in the majority of these cases, almost nothing happens to the officers who are involved in these cases. Uh, they collect pay while they're being investigated and then go back to being police officers. Um, what I think that, and so I think that the layer of accountability at a local level is important. Because the other thing we would say here is, you know, we've seen in recent years many, a not insignificant number of chiefs and commissioners who have been willing to publicly talk about the needs for reforms across, across this industry. But I think that an important thing to note and to remember very often is that a chief who is willing to talk about reforms is a chief who's going to be a former chief in a year or two. Mm -hmm. uh, the average tenure for an American police chief is two to three years. Um, and, and in very few cases, have, there have been chiefs willing to publicly and privately battle both their unions as well as their union arbitrators and fire officers involved in shootings. And in most of those cases, that, that chief has gone pretty quickly. And so I just think it speaks to the entrenched problem and the depths to which the system actually has to be completely disrupted if we are to create a world where there is some level of justice and equity here. Thanks, Wilson. Um, at this time, we'd love to open it up to the audience for some questions and answers. Um, please remember to keep it brief. We don't have very, very much time. No more than 30 seconds. And this would not be the best stage for speeches and preaching. <laughs> Please come up to the mic. Either mic in the front. Oh, okay. Never mind. Okay. We have these lovely Fabulous. mic runners on either side. So if you raise your hand, then they will bring you a mic. Hi. Thank you all so much for sharing and speaking. Um, I'm sure there are other questions that might um, fall within this, but I'm just curious to know, how do you all feel the Second Amendment plays into this? Because I really appreciate the conversation about demilitarization uh, of our police force. Um, what does that look like in a nation that allows their citizens to just have and bear arms? Um, and there's so much pushback against those changes as well. So I, I, I think that the, I think that we have to understand the Second Amendment and its revival over the last decade, two decades, as part and parcel of a political rhetoric of fear. Um, it's a it's a it, we have had politicians essentially saying to the white public, you need to fear black violence, brown violence, and also, and this is an important, government won't protect you. We're going to try, but government fundamentally won't protect you because government does too much to coddle minorities through welfare, through lax criminal law enforcement more recently, through an unwillingness to police the border. Government is, the, you know, is to blame because it's government that's allowing in refugees who are ultimately going to be killers. Right? And so the message from so many politicians is you will need to defend yourself. You will need to arm yourself. And, and it also corresponds with a message about the economy. It says to people, you're on your own. So if you're broke, that's OK, because you're a rugged individual with a gun. Don't blame the corporations. Look around for other, other powerless people who are likely to commit violence against you and be prepared to kill them first. So what we have is an entire culture built around a, a false but deeply felt sense of threat especially among whites who are the most racially isolated, right? It, it's the whites who have the least contact with people of color who are the most fearful. 
of, of black and brown violence. So we have this culture, and that culture says that your right as an American is not to housing, it's not to a decent job, it's not to health care, it's not to food, it's to have a gun. Mm -hmm. And so, so it, it's not the Second Amendment as constitutional law, it's the Second Amendment as part of a political culture which tells people you're on your own, arm yourself, that's your right. Right? That's part of the culture that we need to change. And that actually kind of goes back to, to what Carol Anderson was saying. To convince people that blacks aren't criminal is to say to people, and whites aren't innocent, and this is not a society that, that must remain fundamentally rooted in violence. This is a society capable of recognizing shared humanity across lines of race and class and gender and sexual orientation and religion, and when we do, we can put down our guns. We ought to put down our guns. Frankly, we ought to take away the number of guns that are out there. Mm. And, and, and that ought to extend to the police. So it's, it's part of, let me just say, sorry. Uh, police aren't going to disarm anytime soon. This is a political movement. And more than anything else, it's a political conversation. right? And, the, and that's the benefit. And then to link that conversation to the idea that we ought not to be a society that sees one fundamental right among its people the right to a gun, but not to any of the basic human necessities. That's absurd. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, we have a question up here. <coughs> Ooh, get there first. <laughs> <laughs> You're the winner. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Jen Fry. So I have a question. Uh, we've seen the shootings, and we've seen the consistent obvious cover-ups, the cover-ups that move so smoothly that this isn't a first time. Like with the Laquan McDonald shooting, that immediately it was, you go talk to the witnesses to make sure that they stay quiet. You go get the video and cut out exactly that amount of time that even the video on the fries was taken out because we know the fries were an issue. Mm -hmm. You know, So I think that we've seen that it's just very consistent, very smooth moving, and it also sh is showing us that we have video of these shootings that if it was me shooting someone, I would be locked up forever. But the cops, it, they're not going to jail. It's not, cover, it's not, the bad cops aren't going to jail. So what can we do more as citizens? Because just in my opinion, it seems to be giving the cops more power because they're seeing that I can shoot someone in cold blood with video, I'm gonna get a nice paid vacation, and they go back on the force with no issue. So what can we do? Well, like I said, in the last response to the last question, I mean, the system is working as it is intended to work. Um, our legal system does not treat police officers the way it treats you or I. Um, and, and that in part because we all have not, in, in many ways we, I mean the media and the white majority of the nation have not paid attention to this. We've also allowed the police to further manipulate the system um, in ways to advantage themselves. So for example, were you to shoot me right now, uh, they would immediately put you in handcuffs and take you to the station and interview you. Um, were a police officer to come in here and shoot me, depending on their union contract, he'd probably get 48 hours before he'd ever have to be interviewed. Um, 48 hours in which he could talk to the other police officers who were in the room mm -hmm. about what they maybe saw or did not see. Um, he could talk to his attorney, very likely his union attorney, the same attorney for all the other officers in the room about what they saw or did not see. Um, and then he would say that the pen in my hand looked like a gun. He was scared. Uh, our legal system does not require police to be right. Um, the standard is if they can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they, that they were worried about a thing they are allowed to kill. I think that that, and I think uh, Netta and the folks at Campaign Zero have outlined in many specific ways that that can begin to be undone. But the first of that is scrutiny of the actual governing documents that govern um, how police, uh, what is required of them, um, and, and what leeway they have. Again, these union contracts are negotiated every few years typically in the complete cover of darkness. If they get any media coverage whatsoever, it's, a, it's one story about whether or not the cops get a raise this year or not. Um, and there's almost no discussion very often of these types of um, statutes that are being placed. There, there are union contracts that rule that every few years or every six months, embarrassing things must be struck from an officer's personnel file. There are union contracts that stretch the 48-hour rule, quote unquote, which is based on nonsensical science that is not science, two weeks. In Baltimore, do you, I think you got two weeks before they could interview an officer, right? So I just think that that, that 
policing is a local issue because of the structure of our government. There are 18,000 departments um, that are governed essentially by their own laws and bylaws. And so it's so engaging at that local level about what are the rules in the place where I exist and how might we undo some of the things that have been put in place. And an important thing to remember is that those union contracts are the reason they're negotiated the way they are, typically by mayors of municipalities, um, uh, is because police officers vote in blocks. Um, mm -hmm. That's logically they would, like taxi cab drivers do and teachers do. And, and in municipal elections, relatively small blocks of voters are critical to the outcomes of elections. And so if you want there to be a mayor of your municipality that is open to these sorts of concerns, then there has to be a corresponding block of people mm -hmm. who are going to vote on this issue. Uh, and that's the only way that those things begin to change. But those things can change very dramatically and very quickly if people will exercise their their right to be a part of that process. Uh, my answer would be to resist and to rebel. I would probably guess that you're really comfortable right now. Um, even though you're angry, you're not angry enough. So getting real uncomfortable, getting as angry as you can be, and then resist, however that looks. That's what I did. Thank you. We could have one more question. We have a hand up here. Oh. I um, would like to know, how do I channel this fear I have? I have a nephew, and he's 30, and I'm in fear every day that he might not come home. And I love this little boy. You just, I love him. He's smart. He works hard. He's never been in trouble. And I'm I know he's smart enough. If he were to be stopped by the cop, he wouldn't do anything stupid. But as you know, you don't have to do anything to be killed these days. So I'm trying to figure out how, how I handle this fear. Because I have to talk to him every day because I need to know he's OK. So what do I do besides going to therapy? <laughs> what? I, don't, I don't know. Thank uh, you. Can I go? I would say um, one of the first things, I, like I had to tell my grandma when she was upset that I might could be hurt, that she needs to, if I am hurt, then you respond in the way that you do when you, your, your loved one is hurt, which is what we did in Ferguson. And not many of us even knew Mike Brown. I don't know Mike Brown to save my life, but I still left my house and fought my family because I refused to not, to not voice that I was upset. I would say crying is okay. I noticed that you were about to cry. Um, and it's okay to cry. I would also say that it's not just black boys. They kill black girls too. They kill black women too. They killed el elderly black women also. Mm -hmm. Trans women. Every black person in our community is prey, basically. So I would say extend that same worry. Well, not don't extend worry. Worrying is like literally has no transformational value at all. You worry, he still comes home every day. You're going to still be worried. And then it kind of like creates like a scenario where it's something, something has to happen because you're worried about it. So I would say releasing that worry would be good. Um, and just trust that he's protected and that he is smart and that he will know what to do if something does happen. Oh, and go see Erica <laughs> or Rochelle. <laughs> well, uh, please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists.